you know, natural leaders have to have humility. And that goes back to your arrogance yeah. and confidence. You need to be humble and humility, not necessarily thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. If I'm a leader, my job isn't to make my company make a gazillion dollars. My job is to help everybody who works at my company be extremely successful however they define success. And that's a really important part. It goes back to active listening. So if success for Bob, who's making widgets, is to run a department, and that's really what he wants, well, we've got to figure out what kind of skills does Bob need? What does he have? How do we get him there? joined today by Jordan Modiano, a leadership consultant, public speaker, and mentor who touches the lives of those he encounters, myself included. His personality is characterized by intensity, honesty, passion, and a competitive spirit. He is the owner of Express Employment Professionals in the Capital Region of New York, a firm dedicated to helping companies discover outstanding employees, boost profitability, reduce staff turnover, and help people find fulfilling jobs. Before establishing Express Employment Professionals, Jordan's career was deeply rooted in the sales aspect of the advertising industry. He is also a professional race car driver, using this platform, among others, to raise funds and advocate for autism awareness, a cause close to his heart as he is the father of a daughter with autism. Jordan is a man on a mission to change the world one person at a time and really believes that every person can make a difference. This is evident in all aspects of his life, from his personal relationships to his work at Express Employment Professionals throughout his firm he transforms the lives of, by creating job opportunities and through his speaking career offers leadership training and inspires others with his motivational speeches he is a master storyteller i have personally heard many of his stories and every time i leave the conversation feeling more inspired more energized and super motivated so not to put any pressure on you jordan but i know he's going to do the same for this audience so welcome to prospecting on purpose Thank you so much, Sarah. That was an absolutely incredible introduction. And you talk about not putting any pressure on me. Oh, my Lord. How am I going to live up to that introduction? Oh, uh, I have faith that you will deliver. And I feel like before we get into all the like really juicy goodness, I need to ask some questions about race car driving. I don't know anything about racing cars. So if I could ask you, like, what's the most interesting or jaw dropping piece of trivia you would share about racing cars? The most interesting or the most jaw dropping trivia about racing cars. I don't think there's any one thing that's interesting because there's so many different types of racing cars. There's, you know, everybody's seen the Fast and the Furious. So there's mm -hmm. the street racing, there's drag racing with cars that in less than three seconds hit over 200 or 300 miles an hour. Then there's everybody knows about NASA car and going around in circles just seems crazy. And why would you want to drive in circles for hours? What I happen to do is probably the closest thing to NASCAR on dirt. It's dirt racing on an oval. And what's something that's unique about it is that for the most part, all of these drivers get out onto a racetrack and, you know, you strap a helmet on and you tighten up your belt and you're all alone and everybody's the enemy. And then as soon as you're done, everybody's family again. And it's really an incredible racing community, incredible racing family. And I've seen throughout my life how racers come together to help with different causes, to help other racers. And it's just, it's amazing what the racing community can do for each other. Okay, I heard three big takeaways there. One, I didn't really, I've never put thought to the different types of racing. So thanks for giving us some language there. Absolutely. Um, I, I really like everybody's the enemy and then everybody's family. I feel like there's some sales <laughs> parallels to draw there. Absolutely. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then I like that, you know, using the platform and using the community for good. I think that that really speaks to your message and what your core being is. So I appreciate that rundown and I'm excited to dive into some of these things. Sure. The first thing I want to ask you, when I was preparing for this interview, I saw a quote on your website specific around leadership and it, the quote read, you can't and shouldn't manage people. People should be led. Absolutely. Can you dive into what you mean by that? Sure. So you can't and shouldn't manage people. People should be led. It's really simple. If you think about the things in your life that you manage, 
Okay. I know my mother because she's older now. She still manages her checking account and she still manages her checkbook and she uses a check log. Most people don't do that anymore, but they do manage their finances by whether it's be logging into their bank and seeing where they are, or doing something online. That's what gets managed. There are production managers in all types of companies that manage a process. And that could be anything from the production process of creating widgets. And I'm just making up names, yep. but that's a manager. The Walmart has inventory managers. They've got mm -hmm. to figure out what's going to sell off the shelves and what's not going to sell off the shelves. So we have managers for like, you have schedule managers where you manage a schedule. You can have logistics managers where you manage what's getting shipped and what's not getting shipped. But everything that we're talking about that we manage is an item. Okay. Mm. It's not living and breathing beings that have thoughts of themselves, that have the ability to do things for themselves. You don't manage people. You can't pick a person up and put them in a specific box and expect a certain set of outcomes. You have to lead people and it's a, it becomes a much different mindset. And the mindset's hard to break sometimes because most positions while leadership positions have manager titles, mm. they just do. So it's hard to kind of step out of that and say, wait a minute, my title says office manager. And yes, part of my job is to make sure we don't run out of inventory in the office. And part of my job is to make sure that we have the right staff at the right time. But the bigger and more important part of my job is to be the office leader and to lead by example, to help people when they need them, to be empathetic, to hold accountability, to do all that other all those other things that a true leader is doing to get the most out of people. Does that help clarify that quote? Yeah, I think that that was excellent. And now I have a bunch more questions. <laughs> I'm sure you do. So what what would you say is, I mean, I, okay. So question number one, I would say is, do you think people, I feel like the reason why you're putting this out there is it's not talked about as openly as it should be. Is that an accurate statement? It's not talked about as openly as it should be. And even more than that, what we see happen on a consistent and regular basis is people or are people who can do a job really well. And let's use making widgets. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it doesn't offend anybody. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about making widgets. So we've got a group of 15 people who make widgets and Bob or Bonnie or whoever makes widgets better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. They're higher quality, they're higher quantity, faster, no mistakes, etc. Now we have an opening for a manager for the widget department. It only makes sense that we give it to the top performer, right? Well, no, absolutely not. Just because they're the best at making the widgets and they could do them with better quality and faster doesn't necessarily mean they should run the department. Maybe they could be the QC manager and they're doing quality control because they understand what a good product looks like and how many should come out. But it doesn't mean they know how to motivate people. Doesn't mean no, they, they know how to be an active listener. Doesn't mean they know how to hold people accountable and get the most out of people. And you know, being in an employment agency and dealing with so many companies, we see that time and time again, where we have people who don't want to stay working someplace because management is just that, management. And then you've got that person who was doing the great widgets who gets the job as manager and they get a term that I like to call manageritis. So now they have a title. Now they are the bomb. Do what I say. Don't worry about what I do. I have the title. You don't. I'm better than you. That's so far from being a leader. Yeah, because so Bob and Bonnie get the role and then they don't necessarily have those core competencies to lead people. Correct. You know, it's funny you talk about the example of people wanting to leave. You always hear quotes that the reason why somebody leaves a job is more often than not, they dislike their manager. You never hear that quote by saying they dislike their leader. It's true. Yeah, I never thought uh, about it that way. But it, it's true. There's an actual, a great book, I forget the name of the author, Monday Morning Leadership. And okay. right on the front of the book, it says, people quit people, not companies. Yeah. So what and do you it's think? it's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I, when I would, one of my roles I resigned from years ago, 
my direct boss who I loved, he said, is this a management issue? And I said, of course not. It's not, you know, and I think that that was the biggest concern he had and it's, it was not the case. And we have a great relationship still. He's a great mentor of mine, but he was a great leader. Always Uh asked me for feedback, really let me run with my guardrails. Like I loved working for that man. So I'd be curious. Yeah. What, what do you think are the critical differences between managers and leaders? Like if you're looking at the line of 15, how, how does the decision makers decide who to elevate? So that's a fantastic question. It's really not, you can't just look at the line of the 15 widget makers and decide who. Yeah, you, you have to. You, I worded that question weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to kind of spend some time getting to know them. And many times, if you sit back and you watch from afar, leaders shine to the occasion. You don't need the title to be a leader. Okay. Most of the great leaders I know, at some point in time, they were on a, a team and they were just the natural leaders. They're in the group of their friends. They're the natural leaders. They're the ones. And the reason they are the ones is they have some inherent skills that can be taught, but more often than not, they're a natural ability. And for those who don't have them, they've got to work hard to them. So being an active listener, okay, and listening to understand and comprehend is really important aspect of a leader because people want to communicate with you and it's your job to take in that communication. So that's one. I'm going to say having some thick skin because if you're a leader, you've got to be able to take the honest feedback. And sometimes it sucks. We've all received feedback that sucks. All right. What you do with that feedback is everything. I mean, I will tell you right now, I'm a far better leader today than I was a year ago. And I was far better a year ago than I was when I first opened up Express Employment. And when I first opened Express, I was far better than when I started my first business years and years ago. That's because people call me out. I get called out on a regular basis. I mean, we had a challenging issue this morning and I had somebody tell me, go take a walk. You know, like, so the real message was, you're not handling this best way right now. (laughs) Go cool off. Yeah. Great. I needed that. Yeah. You know, and I didn't get upset. I didn't get offended by it. They called me out. So leaders need to, they need to know that. Leaders also need to be able to have a tough conversation and and tough conversations are hard because there's a lot of people in this world who think to be a good leader, you need to be liked. That's a nice benefit. Mm -hmm if you happen to get it, but I'd much rather be respected. Now, understand as a leader, I'd rather be respected. There are many managers who'd say, I don't care if you respect me or not, you're gonna do what I tell you to do. I'm okay being feared. No, 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 okay? You don't want your people to fear you. You don't want people to cringe when you walk into the room. You wanna walk into the room and have people excited that you're there. You want people who wanna run through walls for you. And that's really a, a major component of what that leadership is like. You know, my team jokes around and they have a nickname for me the janitor. Okay. Cause I will, I'll clean the bathroom. I'll take out the garbage. I'll do whatever I need to do. We did a major sales blitz a few weeks ago and I was running around with cookies and donuts and coffee for people like, Hey, what can I get you to help you succeed today? Way different than a management mindset where I'd be sitting in an office, looking over a window, looking down on the floor of people and saying, who's performing what? Let's look at the numbers and let's have a conversation and go yell at somebody because they're not performing to the level they should be performing at. Wow. Okay. So many things to run with before, yes. <laughs> before I get into it. I them, just went crazy. Sorry. No, no, but I liked it. So um, active listening, I thought that was excellent. And I really appreciated the line of people want to communicate with you and it's your job to allow that. I think about the leaders versus managers that I've collaborated with and you're right. Like the, com- the communication has to be a two-way street and people have to feel comfortable coming to you. So go ahead. With that, you have to make sure you have the availability and they have the opportunity Mm -hmm. for that communication. Meaning my team knows my phone's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They need to talk to me on the weekend. They can, you know, and my doors, unless I'm doing something with one of my team members or or in a meeting or a podcast like this, my door is open. Come on in, talk to me. I have no problem with that. So yes, you need to be an active listener, but you also have to be available for that communication. Excellent clarification and structure and time to be accessible. Absolutely. Thick skin and tough convos. I want to dive into those too. Mm -hmm. 
I really appreciated how you talked about being open to being called out. I do think that that's an area where people struggle. And when you think about being liked versus respected versus feared, I do see clear delineations between a manager going the fear route versus a leader going the respected route. And I almost kind of tie those two things to confidence and arrogance. Like, I think I see a lot of people, because I talk a lot about confidence and there's a difference between confidence and being secure in what you bring to the table. I'd put that in the respect bucket, the leadership bucket. But then when you think about arrogance, I would put that in the fear bucket. Like, this is how you think a manager should behave. So you're acting this way instead of just being your authentic, confident, respected self. Any other, so active listening, availability, thick skin, tough combos, any other traits that stand out of like what makes a natural leader? So, I mean, there, there are so many that make the natural leader. I think humility, you know, natural leaders have to have humility. And that goes back to your arrogance and confidence. You know, you need to be humble and, you know, humility, not necessarily thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. So the concept of if I'm a leader, my job isn't to make my company make a gazillion dollars. My job is to help everybody who works at my company be extremely successful, however they define success. And that that's a really important part. It goes back to active listening. So if success for Bob, who's making widgets, is to run a department, and that's really what he wants, well, we've got to figure out what kind of skills does Bob need? What does he have? How do we get him there? You know, and if we talked about Bonnie and her success is to be able to own her home, own her own home with a white picket fence and two dogs, well, we've got to figure out how to help her get there. Totally different things. But again, that active listening and understanding and being available for your people to help them achieve their goals. Because if they're achieving their goals, I promise you, they're going to help you achieve your goals. Oh, look at this, everyone. He's just dropping truth bombs left and right. So now I want to ask about but using the Bonnie and Bob example. How do you as a leader carve out the time to understand what their goals and what their personal and professional goals are. Is it asking? Is it, do you have a process or a structure for that? Yes and no. So I I think as a leader and size of company makes a difference. So, you know, we've got under 15 employees right now. So I have the opportunity and the availability to get to know everybody on a personal basis and spend some time every week with people and kind of learn what's important and what's not. And some of that just comes from the culture of who we are in the open door policy. But as companies grow and, you know, as we grow and we have 30 or 40 people, I might not be able to do that with 30 or 40 people. So my might have it with 15, but then, you know, in that 15, I'm going to have my core leadership team, not management team, leadership team, and they've got to have it with theirs and it becomes a trickle down. So how do you find the time? Well, like anything else, you've got to determine what's a priority and what's not. You know, I, I can decide that, sitting with my bookkeeper and reviewing revenue is a priority and my people aren't. Or I could decide, bookkeeper, can you just send me the reports? I'll look at them tonight or on the weekend because my priority during the day is I've got to get to my team and I have to spend some time with my team. I love that. So prioritizing leadership. Sure. You know, my team and I, we have a saying, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. Yeah. If not, you'll find an excuse. And the people that work for those managers can definitely tell. 100%. Yeah. You know, managers who don't talk to you, who don't check in, who don't do some of this stuff. It is what it is. I'm a number. Okay. The leaders want to know what's going on. How's your day going? What's going on? You know, and if you're in tune with your team, you pick up on things. Mm -hmm. Some people are better at it than others. That's just the way it is. Some people pick up on it too much. You know, I work with somebody who's a huge empath. And, you know, if we've got a team member who's going through trouble, she literally feels it. And it's amazing to see. And then I feel bad for her because it's like she feels the same pain they feel. But that also builds such an amazing relationship that she has the ability to understand what they're going through, you know? So, and that's just a natural born trait. You know, you you can't teach that to somebody. Well, I like that you're using that as one of her strengths too, because I think most managers would put that in a like weakness category. 100%. And here's the thing about strengths and weaknesses, and, and it doesn't make a difference what it is, but anything to an extreme is going to be a weakness. 
Oh, that's good. Okay. Anything. So, you know, I could take my leadership to an extreme and, you know, care so much about people and put people so first and do this and do that. I'm going to actually end up hurting the business. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, I still have to manage the business. Mm -hmm. My role as a leader is to lead my people. It doesn't mean I forgot about managing the business. I still have to pay attention to the finances. I still have to pay attention to the numbers. I still have to marry all of that together and realize if, you know, Bonnie is having some struggles and some tough times, as a leader, I need to help her and coach her through that. But as the guy who manages and runs the business, I have to make sure that we're focused on not only helping her, but we have to help the company as well. Right. That's great. And the very clear lines in the sand between manager and leader, I can already tell in our conversations and how I've been thinking about things, I'm dropping them into the appropriate buckets a little bit more consistently. So thank you for giving us this language because I think it's really powerful. Absolutely. Well, before we switch gears, because I do want to talk about your personal mission, can we address if people are listening to this and they feel that maybe they have some negative management techniques, how can you help give them some tools to flip it into more positive leadership styles? So we've done this before with some folks. If you're struggling with negative management techniques, there's a few key things to think about. Number one, are you doing and portraying the role that you would like your people to do. So if you have an expectation that your people are going to show up early every day, are you showing up early every day? If you have an expectation that your people are going to dot their I's and cross their T's and turn out high quality work, are you turning out high quality work? You know, those are some basics, but you know, manager is great. Do what I say, not what I do. Leadership is follow my example. Walk the talk too. Mm -hmm. right? Follow my example, walk the walk, talk the talk, do it all. So that's one component on, you know, the difference. The second difference is leadership is get to know the people. You have, they are people. They're not widgets. You have to know your people and you have to have an understanding that four people doing the same exact thing all feel differently about what they're doing, all see it differently and all want to be someplace else differently in five years. Mm. So you can't motivate them the same way. You can't treat them the same way. And you need to understand the differences between them. So widget maker number one having a bad day can be completely different than why widget maker number two is having a bad day. And they both might be work-related and they both might be caused by widget number three. And one might be unhappy with the way widget number three speaks to them or widget mm -hmm. maker number three. And one might be unhappy that widget maker number three isn't keeping up with production levels because they want more for the team. Right. So back to open listening and kind of hearing, you, you've got to connect with people. Leaders have to connect with people. They've got to understand that with people. That's, Does that help? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm thinking of so many past examples as you're giving those examples. The same boss that I mentioned when I left that role, at the time I shared an office with, um, I managed the commercial team, he managed the residential team, and we shared an office and we could not be more opposites. We got along right. great. Everyone, everyone cracked up over our friendship. We could not have been more different. And so we both reported to the same leader. And when that leader would start meetings with my colleague, they would just get right into business. No fluff, no chit chat, no, you know, just nothing could offend the other one. And then when I had my touch bases, it was always, how are your grandma and grandpa? Da, 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 da. Like we had to do all the chit chat catch up. And I knew he was doing that for me, not for him, but I needed to, you know, we would talk once a week. So that's when I would talk to him and we'd get up to speed on the grandparents and then we'd get into work. <laughs> so you're talking about personality styles and totally. mirroring personalities. So we do something called a disc assessment. Oh, that's what and he did. <laughs> that's ex I, I know that's exactly what yeah. he did because as you described him, he was considered a high D. Yeah. He was a doer or dominant and get things done. You're a high I. You're very much into people. You need that fluff and that how are you doing? So I'm a high D. Yeah. I don't need any of that fluff. We can just go right into conversation. Yeah. So when me and another high D are speaking, people sit on the side and they're like, like watching a fast tennis match and it's facts. Boom, 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 boom. And I'll be done and I'll go have a conversation with somebody and say, oh, did you talk to Bob today? I did. How's he doing? No clue. <laughs> 
you know, that, that wasn't part of the conversation. Those two men it, were high Ds for okay. sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, if I have a conversation with somebody who's a high I or an SI, okay, SI is going to be more supportive. I is more influential. They're way more people oriented. Okay, how are you doing? What's mm -hmm. going on? How's the wife? How's the kids? How's grandma? How's whatever? You know, we need those niceties first. As a high D, I'm like, can we just get to this? Yeah. But yeah. as a leader, I have to do that because if I don't, whether I intended it to or not, I am cold. I'm not personable. Uh, I'm missing all of that. So I've got to know where my strengths are and what my communication styles are. But I also need to know what everybody on my team is like. So remember I said it's my job to communicate with them and their job to communicate with me. Well, when they communicate with me, I have to make sure my reciprocating communication is in their style. Understood. And I, I didn't mean to take us down the disc train, but, I, That's but okay. I'm happy we're chatting about it because from a from a sales capacity, I enjoyed learning disc because I could quickly identify who my customers were. Absolutely. And so I'm not going to send a long narrative email to a high D who just wants bullet points. You know, I had to, I had to fire a couple of rep agencies and I was really nervous about it. I was just anxious about it, but I figured out they were D's. I didn't do any fluff or BS. It was just, Hey, here's the situation. Here's where I'm at. Here's what I need to communicate with you. It was the most pleasant conversation. I was so happy with how it went, but it, I know it was because I flexed to their style. Circling back to managers versus leaders, we've all heard the phrase, you have to manage your manager. Mm -hmm. I definitely have worked for people or collaborated with people that were, you know, dotted line leaders and you as the subordinate, you know, to, for lack of a better term, if I'm communicating up, I'm doing my best to communicate in their style too. So I think that that's an interesting piece on the managers who could flex or mm -hmm. excuse me, the managers who couldn't flex to the other person's styles, as opposed to the leaders who flex to the other person. I think that's a core differentiator. Well, it's an absolutely core differentiator. And going back to what we were talking about before, being available and open for that communication. So if I have somebody on my team who's going to come and communicate with me, to make it easy for them and to make it so they can get what they need from me, my job is to communicate back with them in their style. As much as it's out of what I'm naturally comfortable with, that's my job. As a manager my mindset might be slightly different. My manager mindset might be slightly, well, you're coming to me, you speak to me in my style. And by all means, I'm not saying all managers are like this because there are many managers who have the title of manager and down deep, they're just a great leader. Mm -hmm. They really are, you know? So it doesn't mean that you, because you have the title, you're not a phenomenal manager. We're talking about the people who have the title and they actually live to the manager ideal and not the leadership ideal. Mm-hmm. I think that this this line of communication and in and, and relationship to other people, I think this is a great example of being a leader in whatever your role is, whether that's an individual. Cause I, I loved what you said at the top of the interview. Anyone can be a leader. Correct. And I think I know we're talking a little bit, we're talking very specifically about leading people as a as a reporting structure. But I do think if you have the ability to flex to the other person and speak in their style, that's core leadership, regardless of what your role is, regardless of if you have direct reports. Absolutely agree. Awesome. Oh, this is so fun. Okay. So now we understand the traits and qualities of impactful leaders. I would like to spend a little time here because I want to get into this. Your mission of changing the world one person at a time. What is the origin story here? I don't know if I have one origin story. I, 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 I don't know. So... I'll go back years and I'll give you some bits and pieces of stories to okay. get to where I am today. Cool. It, it had to be 2004, 2005. I was driving to work. My wife at that time still is school psychologist with a PhD. And it was a Monday morning and she called me on a Monday morning and she let me know that she wasn't going to be in the elementary school that she normally worked in. She was just called to go to the high school. And I was like, why? What's up? And she said, unfortunately, uh, one of the students committed suicide over the weekend. And she was going there to counsel other students and parents and teachers. And uh, I remember very clearly, I even remember the road I was on. I remember the car I was in. I had my left turn signal on waiting to make a, a turn. And I remember thinking to myself how sad I was that somebody hit that level and didn't get the help 
And I remember in the same thought process, being happy that my wife got to go do something that was going to make a difference. And then being a combination of sad and jealous that mm. what I do doesn't impact people. And I, I kind of always had that void after that because, you know, at that point in time, I was... I don't know if I was a national sales manager, sales trainer, something in sales for mm -hmm. one of the larger media groups in the capital region of New York. And it was like, you know, whatever, it doesn't impact people the same way. Fast forward 2015, and I'm thinking about, you know, partnering or, or franchising with express employment professionals. And the more I learn about it, the more I learn how much we get to impact people and we get to change people's lives. And I just be like, you know what, this is you know, aside from the ability to actually make an income and do something, I get to fulfill that component that's been missing in my life. So we start Express Employing Professionals and, you know, treat everybody with dignity, give everybody hope, understand we can't help everybody, but we can give hope for everybody. And a few key lessons happened along the way that I think brought that out in me. You know, when we first started, I, I made it my mission to try and talk to everybody that we help. And it's hard to do that. You know, it's easy to talk to everybody on my team, but if we've got 30 or 50 or 100 people out working to know all of them or talk to all of them, it becomes hard. So we had people who would show up on Friday afternoons to pick up a check. And I would try every Friday afternoon to go up and talk to folks. So I remember this one particular Friday, it was a hot summer day. This guy would ride his bike to us every Friday afternoon after leaving work, drop off his time card and pick up his check. And I would always, you know, I'd leave my office and see it and go out and say hello and talk to people. So this one particular Friday, I'm talking to him and he says to me, or I say to him, can I ask you a question? He's like, sure. And he, he was of Spanish descent and he called me Mr. Jordan. And I'm like, why do you come here every Friday? Like, you don't need to come here. We can give you a pay card. We can get you direct deposit. You can, you know, take a picture of your time card and text it to us. Your supervisor can scan it and email it to us. There's so many other ways than you having to drive your bike here on a hot summer day and do this. And he grabs my hand, he shakes my hand, he brings me up close and he goes, I come here for you, Mr. Jordan. And my eyes open up and I take a step back and right into the wall behind me. And I'm like, for me, why do you come here for me? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you're a big, important man, and you get out of your office, and you come and talk to me, and I know that I matter. And I was like, I will never stop doing that. And I shook his hand, and he walked out the door, and I turned to Nicole, who's sitting at my front desk, and I said, who was that? Because I didn't know everybody's name. Yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm not going to say his name on the podcast, yeah. but I will never forget his name. He will always leave that lasting impact. But as soon as he walked out the door, I grabbed my team together and I said, I want to tell you guys what just happened. And they had all heard it. I said, if he's coming to me from that and I give him a minute of my time a week, what kind of impact are you guys having that we don't know about? You know, we're, we are truly changing people's lives, you know, and it just, I carry that with me because you, you don't know. And we changed his life. He worked for us for a long time and then left and then came back and worked for us again. And it, it's had a ripple effect. You know, we've had people that we've hired internally who've gone through some stuff in their life. And, you know, one of them, I was going to fire him on his fifth day because he was late twice in the first week. And, you know, at the point in time, one of my young ladies pleaded for me to not fire him. I'm so glad I didn't because he ended up working out great. He ended up being with us for a really long time. His brother now works for us. And when he left and he left the market, we had a going away party for him. And there's so much more I can get into, but in the sake of time, I won't. And he got me a plaque because he knew my mission became change the world for one person at a time. And he got me a plaque that says change the world for one person at a time. It actually hangs in my other office. And, you know, he wrote me the most meaningful letter I think I've ever received in my life about what he went through and how I was there for him all the while while he was working. And I didn't know he was going through everything he went through. I knew some and it's just, wow. So then fast forward. And I think this story is probably the exclamation point because it's my longest work, but it's a good one. And you've heard the story. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a, a job fair and it's the tail end of the job fair. And this woman comes walking into the job fair looking very professional. I'm like, I wonder what she's doing here. It looks like she owns the place, right? But I ended up talking to her and she had had some health issues and found herself at a point where she was unemployed and she was looking for work. So I ended up talking to her and scheduled a time for her to come in for an interview. So she comes in for an interview and, you know, you remember things a specific way. She says it didn't exactly happen like this. I beg <laughs> to differ. And I do believe my memory is better than hers. But so 
the way I remember it, as she came into the office and I went around behind the desk and she closed the door before she sat down, she says, I want to be honest with you and tell you I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for three years or four years, whatever it was back then. And I lost my license. I don't drive, but it has never stopped me from getting anywhere. And I thought to myself, damn, this job requires a driver's license. But with that kind of brutal honesty, now I have to look for reasons not to hire this person because I like her. That's right. a, like, I love this brutal honesty and I like helping people, you know? So she's just came here and she had to practice some rigorous authenticity to do that. And rigorous authenticity is one of the things addicts have to do when, or one of the things they've got to practice in their recovery. She had to surrender the outcome, which is one of the other things they have to practice mm -hmm. and really do some uncomfortable stuff. And I can't imagine how uncomfortable that is to tell a potential employer that as your opening line. And she did it. So I'll fast forward. I hired her. I hired her as an office assistant and she did really, really well at that. And then I promoted her to an office manager and she did really, really well at that. And she grew. And I'm going to say her title is office manager. She's a leader. She doesn't know how to manage. All right. And she's great at our processes and things like that, but she's not, I have the title. Do you do what I say? And when I say she doesn't know how to manage, she doesn't know that. That does not come to her. All right. Leading comes to her. So then over time, I was like, you know what? She's helping us so much on our operations side because she is great with processes and policies and she comes from a legal background. And I was like, we're going to make her operations manager. And operations leader is truly the title it should be. But operations leader sounds dumb. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That makes sense. So it's an OM. It's an ops yeah. manager. Yeah. But she, she is a leader. And even the feedback she gets about leading is how empathetic she is and how understanding she is with people and how, you know, she brings the fun way more than I do. And we've now had the opportunity to do things like go and speak to the Albany Addiction Center. And the Albany Addiction Center has two components to it. They've got a male side and a female side, and they're kept separately. And We've now been down there a few times, the last time being this past Monday. And the amazing thing is that, you know, we went down on Monday and we're talking to women in the Albany Addiction Center. And I stopped by telling them, I said, you know, I, I want to share a story with you guys. And I tell them the part that I just told you. And I, mm -hmm. and her name is Sarah and I have her standing there with me. And, and I tell them that, you know, this woman came to me and, you know, I hired her as an office assistant, then an office manager. And then eventually she got promoted to an operations manager. And, you know, here we are. She's seven plus years sober. She just got her license back within the last six months. She drives again. And oh, by the way, she's standing here to my left. And they all turn and they look at her and it's like, oh, my God. And every single one of them can see hope. They can see inspiration. Mm -hmm. They can they know that there's somebody out there. And I'm not unique. There's a lot of people out there who want to take a chance and want to help somebody. Mm -hmm. But I think here's the best part of that whole story. Sarah has wanted to, on her own mission, help people and talk to people. And like the majority of the people in the world, there's a fear of public speaking. There's a anxiety that comes with it. And I'm saying more of an anxiety than a fear. You know, anxiety is based on something that's perceived, per, you know, the fear is based on something that's real. So she's had that anxiety, but when we got in the car to go, she said, look at these index cards. I, I want to talk today. And I had, that was never a conversation we had. And I said, hell yeah. And she got up there and she went through her index cards and she aced it. She had people in the room crying. She was close to crying and talk about talking about the ripple effect of helping people change the world. You know, I know for a fact, some of those women are never going to forget that day. They're yeah. never going to forget Sarah. And they're going to have a conversation with somebody later on down the road and say, I met this woman who did this and did this and did this. And I told them when she was done that she's always been afraid of doing this and her growth is still happening. She just did it. And they clapped her. They were so proud for us. It's just how we are. You can, you can very clearly see the ripple effect, I think, in these stories and how one act of taking a chance, being open to something that maybe you haven't been open to in the past. Like what mm -hmm. would have happened if you hadn't hired her? You know, she's been with you how many years? Five years, Five. seven, six years. I don't know how okay. long she's been with me. It feels what? like she's been with me forever, but you're so right. Yeah. What would have happened if I didn't hire her? My impact wouldn't be nearly as high as it is. Right. Our impact wouldn't be as high as it is. I probably wouldn't have the same team that I have because there are some of them that totally gravitate towards her. In some cases, she keeps me in check from not just, you know, reverting to being a manager sometimes. Right. 
Well, and I think about what you're talking about, the feedback that she gets from the team on her leadership style is, uh, you know, empathy, active listening, all of the traits that you Mm -hmm. outlined earlier in the interview about leadership qualities. But it makes me think probably she can be open to being more empathetic because of her past struggles with alcohol. And I think that that in turn into a strength versus a weakness. And I think that the judgment is a perceived weakness. And it's so cool that not only did you hire her, your business benefited by hiring her, the team that reports to her works for her benefits. But now with the Albany Addiction Center, you're giving hope and ripple effect to people in similar situations. I think that that's so so beautiful. You are correct. And you know, you're right. She did have a, a troubled past. But haven't we all in some fashion or another? And, you know, we can sit there and think, I couldn't have gone through what she went through. Well, maybe she couldn't have gone through what you went through or what I went through. Or, or, you know, we're all different. We all have our stuff. Going back to being a leader, it's your job to kind of get to know that person. You know, I love hiring people who've had a challenge. Okay. People who've had a fight. People who've had, who've been kicked down and got back up. Who would you rather have on your team? Somebody who's taken a beating and got back up and is going to continue to fight another day or somebody who's read it really easy. And when that fight comes, you have no idea. Are they going to run and hide? Are they done? What are they? You know, wow. we've heard the phrase rock bottom is a great foundation upon which to build. It really is. Yeah. Okay. It really is. And you can hit different versions of rock bottom multiple times in different aspects of your life, but then it becomes a solid foundation onto which to build. And as long as you keep getting up and keep going, you win. You know, Thomas Edison, 1,000 light bulbs that didn't work. He didn't fail 1,000 times. He learned 1,000 ways that didn't work. So then his 1,000th one He didn't repeat those. He just made slight modifications across the way. And now we have light. I think that what you, what Sarah, what people are putting out in the world, you're doing it very authentically too. And I appreciate being so open in this discussion because I think it's going to inspire others. I also, you know, reading your bio, we've had a lot of speakers on this show. I call, I'm, I'm a speaker as well, but I don't put the word motivational in front of anything, but with you, I think you truly are like the epitome of a motivational speaker. And we just scratched the surface on this interview too. I know you have so many stories that (laughs) I do that we could put people in a tears, but uh, (laughs) try to keep the vibes, not crying. Absolutely. (laughs) I mean, you, I, I, and I, I do like you shared in that story with your wife going to the high school. I do really appreciate that you talked about the feelings that you were feeling between sad for the, for the child who, who committed suicide, happy that your wife gets to help a little mix of, of jealousy or this awakening that that was a void. I I like that because we can feel different things at the same time, just like in our work lives, you can be struggling with something on the personal side, but still have to go get your job done. And hopefully you have a leader that has two way communication that you can share that with. So I personally had a lot of really nice takeaways in this discussion. So I just want to give a very sincere thank you to, to spending the time on the show. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. I mean, yeah. this I, I enjoyed the show. I know we get. I mean, we could talk about this all day. Um, we, we could. I, I would have like plenty to more. Know, I can, we could do it again. I know. I Jordan. I I Jordan is based in New York, but he's been doing speeches both local with the local business commerce uh, addiction center. How else can people find you and how can people work with you? So, I mean, they can work with me any number of ways. I'd hate to say this. I haven't updated my website nearly as recently I've had because, so I've got Express Employment Professionals in Albany and Saratoga. And you can Google Express Employment Professionals, Albany, Saratoga, you're going to find me. You can Google Jordan Modiano, motivational speaker. You're going to find me. You can go to jordanmodiano.com. I've got a website. I need to get back on top updating it, but I can only do so much. I thought your website was good. I was like, dang, his website's put together. Um, I'll link all of these in our show notes too. So there's quick access for everyone. Absolutely. That'd be fantastic. And what, what, what topics do you speak on? Because I know we kind of went all around the board and again, we just scratched the surface. So, you know, and that's, that's the amazing part. Um, I like to custom tailor my speeches. So 
like easy leadership and leadership training, a lot of sales or sales training, a lot of confidence building or self-confidence or self-motivation, you know, how to get out of your own head and get going. There, there's so many people in the world who have the opportunity to do more than they are doing and they get in their own head and, and they don't do that. So, you know, I've had conversations with organizations about just coming and talking to their team, just getting them pumped up, mm -hmm. you know, let's go We're you know, we're kicking off, you know, major staff meeting or kicking off a convention and let's get a group of people pumped up and ready to go. You know, I do all of that. Oh, you totally pump me up all the time. I feel like if I need a pep talk, I'm so lucky that that we're friends. And then you I got the hotline. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I appreciate people that are out doing good in the world. And in terms of changing the world one person at a time, I would put me on that list. I know you're probably not keeping a formal list, but add me to the pile of people um, because you truly make an impact on me. And I know that this episode's going to be very well received. So that makes thank me you, happy. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining. And I know we'll, we'll be in touch soon. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you.